All right, today I want to put together a pretty simple sampler in Contact. I'm working in Contact 5. I think even Contact 6 is out now. I'm guessing for what I'm going to do today, it's not going to be that different at all. I mentioned before that sampling traces its lineage back to Musique Concrète out of France, where composers built new pieces out of recorded sounds. I also mentioned we could trace these ideas even further back to the music of Egyptian composer Halim el Dab. Working with Contact, Contact is software and uses samples that are inside your computer, so Contact is a digital sampler. The first commercial piece to use digital sampling was Curtis Blow's If I Ruled the World from 1985, which loops the bass and percussion from Trouble Funk's Pump Me Up, a 1982 piece. Blow did the looping with a Fairlight CMI, which at the time was about $32,000. And Curtis Blow's use of this sampling, of course, owes to the turntabling of Cool Herc and the merry-go-round technique with turntables. Now, all that said, we're not going to be doing loops as samples, we're going to be doing individual notes as samples. I've got nine samples here from my shamisen, which is a Japanese traditional musical instrument, and I want to turn these into a sampled instrument. So just to listen, here's one note. etc. Now I've already gone through my sample editing process, and as I've mentioned before, I got a whole other video on that if you want to check it out, but I've made sure I trim these samples, normalize them, and got them ready to put into my sampler. Now here in Contact, let me start by creating a new instrument. So I've clicked on this disc here, and I'm going to go to New Instrument. Now if I play on my keyboard over here, We can see some MIDI information coming in, but we see that nothing's happening because this new instrument is completely empty. So let me click on my wrench. And then let me start by going over to this mapping editor. This is showing what samples go with what note. So let me go back to my lowest note, which is this C2, and drag this into my sampler. Now let me just dump that in there for now and we'll come back in a moment. Now, we know this note is C2 because I've named it appropriately, and so I can put it here on this C2 there. I can also see the root is set at C2 here. Now, from that note, my sampler transposes all of the other notes coming in. So if I play a G above this, then it'll transpose that C2 up a fifth, and it does that in a digital sampler by actually speeding up how fast it goes through those samples. So let's listen. C2. Whoops, I didn't go up to that C, so all right. Now I can take this and stretch it from the sides. Mm, let's go there. Just go up here. And so we can see, again, the root stays at C2, but the range is now from B1 to D7. So now I can just play on the keyboard. And that all works. That's not a great sounding sampler, but that's an extremely cheap sampler. By cheap here, I mean I'm using one sample. Let's see how much disk space that one sample takes up. Okay, 295, actually that's probably not it. There it is, the one up top. 244 kilobytes. So with just a little bit more work, we can make this sampler slightly better. Now, it's worth understanding that if you buy a professional sample pack, you're probably getting tons and tons of samples. So if you get a sampled piano that you're paying money for, probably it has different samples for every single note and then also several different velocities, several different key pressures that it can read. I'm just going to trim this down now, sliding this over and again. Notice that what's changing here is the upper bounds of that key range. Drag that back down to D there. The reason I chose that note is because my next note up is this E flat 3. Boom. Okay, I dragged onto there. I can see the root is D sharp. Oh no, this is an E flat and my root is D sharp, but actually they're enharmonically equivalent. So we're okay. So now listen, here's that C, D, 
Here's the E flat. And so we can hear there's a different sample in there. I've made a horrible mistake. I've moved in the wrong sample there. So let's delete that. I should have taken this E flat too. Now let's try that. Ah, that's much, much better. Okay, my next note after that E flat two is an F two. So I'm just dragging this now, so it just goes from that D sharp to the E. Then the F. The F goes from the F to the F sharp, or uh, G flat, however we're saying it. G two. Now let's hear this. So now we're switching between different samples as we go up the instrument, and this is useful because while we can accelerate and decelerate that digital audio as much as we like, instruments' timbres actually change across the range of the instrument. So the more samples we have, the more nuanced sound is going to result. C3. Uh, I'm going to have to slide that over. C3 is going to go up to E flat 3. E flat three. Next is my F three. F three. Next is going to be my G three. Finally, I'm going to put in my C four. I'm just going to put that in. Get that in the right place. Stretch this up. And there we go. Now, even more samples would make this sound even better, but I think I've got a pretty nice instrument using just my nine samples. Now, I've played all across this instrument to make sure I'm double checking my sounds, but what I want to do is, for each of these, the range matters, but what really matters is making sure their root is matching what the sampled note is. So that's why it was really important for me at the initial process to label my files properly, to make sure that C2 was actually C2. But of course, I can just play my major scales to double check these and make sure I haven't made any mistakes. That's all I wanted to accomplish for today. Next steps would be, again, more samples, or look at this velocity range here. If I set these to only cover a certain velocity range, then I can set one sample for one velocity and another sample for a different velocity. But then I need multiple samples for each note too. Have some fun, cleanly edit your samples and make some nice instruments.